I say we get started. Okay. And then they can, you know. All right. Get them caught up. So, um, you know, talking about oboe, there's lots going on. It's a very complex mechanism, okay? Um, and a lot of people want to learn the adjustments and that kind of thing. Um, for middle schoolers and high schoolers, I don't necessarily think that's totally appropriate to do the adjustment thing just because you don't have the years of experience of even being a player to kind of understand the mechanism. So. Uh, what I like to talk to you guys about is things that you can do to prevent damage and to help your oboe play better for longer uh, between when you have servicing done. Okay, it is super complicated, so you know we do recommend annual service, uh, especially when you get a pro oboe and there's a lot going on. Um, but you know it depends on how much you play. So you know some people come every couple years, some people come every year and a half. Um, I have a lot of professional clients who just, you know, that's their job, right? So they're playing eight hours a day or something, and and uh, some of them come more than once a year. It just depends on, you know, how their oboes feel in their hands after they play it for a while. But with all that said, just going to kind of go through some things to help you guys stay out of the shop uh, for emergency type stuff. Um, but then, then that ho hopefully that'll help you learn and understand when you need to go just for general maintenance stuff okay so you've been playing for a while your oboes are together and you've been here for a few weeks so you know how to assemble your oboe but I do want to go back and show you how I recommend assembling your oboe and then we'll I'll explain why so Kevin why don't you go ahead and take yours apart and assemble reassemble it I want to see cool. you know we didn't go over this yeah bad 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 we did go over cleaning the tenons <laughs> okay. and the tenon receptacles because yep. theirs was like, oh, baby. Yeah. But we did not go over how to put them together and take them apart. So, so the, the microscope is on you right now. That's <laughs> 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 great. <laughs> Under pressure. I know, right? <laughs> okay, so you did pretty good. Um, you didn't do some massive squeezing, okay? So let's see your oboe. So, you know, I've seen it done uh, lots of ways. You know, a lot of people just kind of grab over the keys like this or, or down here. So basically the, the bottom line principle that I go by and teach people is to only squeeze the keys if you're playing the oboe, okay? So that would mean in playing position, you're squeezing basically these six keys, you know, your pinky keys, that kind of thing, okay? Uh, like you said, there's a lot going on here. Uh, there's inside here, the, that's one long rod that holds all those keys on and likewise down here, uh, this left hand lever, that's one rod all the way down. Okay, so there are some very long things here that can get bent. Uh, this is a very common one. Actually, you got a screw coming out right there. We can fix that. Um, so this key for the, so the C-sharp uh, E-flat lever here, this E-flat piece that comes up over, a lot of people will grab here. And then over time of assembling 10s, 20s, 30s, you know, 50 times, um, very slowly this key bends down by pressing there. And then all of a sudden one day this key binds up and then your E flat like stands open or you know, won't close, close, that kind of thing, okay? So my recommendation, whoa. So I'll just start the bell in the lower joint and so I'm right-handed, so I'll grab the lower joint, um, I'll palm it from underneath, and I'll grab the lower joint down here, and basically I'm using all my fingers to squeeze the wood. Uh, there is a post in the wood right here, and so I'll put my thumb against that post, just gives you a little leverage if you want. Um, most circumstances, you're not gonna hurt that post. <laughs> um, I have seen weird stuff though. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but I'm, so I'm approaching from underneath, palming here, squeezing the wood. I'm not squeezing any keys, and then the bell is pretty uh, self-explanatory. But here's where I go differently. 
If you're adjust, if the oboe is adjusted halfway decent, uh, your bridge keys here and here, and then up here on this joint, they shouldn't bang together when you assemble it. So I'll go ahead and line it up and get it uh, lined up when it's slightly apart, and then I'll use my stomach or my knee, depending on how you want to do it, and then I'll move my right hand to the socket up here, and just very slowly push it straight together, and then theoretically it'll be lined up without having to twist, okay? Mm -hmm. When we put our oboes together and have to twist, a lot of times like this one, if you hit this lever over here, that'll pop up, and, you know, and then you, those keys could bang together, okay? So we don't want any keys banging together. Um, so yeah, go ahead and get it started, get those lined up, and then very slowly push it straight together. Um, and then for the upper joint, again, I'll approach underneath. And this one, you can wrap your fingers around the crown at the top. That way you're not gonna drop it, okay? And then I'll switch my right hand. At this point, I'm going over keys, but again, all the pressure is on the wood, okay? So I'm not actually squeezing the rods. And you can, you can kind of let the bell will rest on the palm of your hand, kind of like that, you know, that's okay. And again, I'll get this started. And then I'll look at the F sharp side of the oboe over here. Go ahead and kind of get it lined up like we did the other one. And then oh, very slowly push that together. Yeah, we need to clean your tenon. We'll do that here in a little bit, okay? So that's how I recommend. And if you haven't done it that way, it's gonna feel super weird. Um, there may be another way that feels better to you, that you feel more secure or whatever, by all means do that. Um, but if you can avoid the keys, okay? Um, the, one of the biggest things is all the adjustment corks. So underneath all these screws that you see all over the place, there's usually some type of material, cork, leather, uh, synthetic material. Um, and then all these pads, these are traditionally cork uh, for the most part. And uh, cork, you know where that comes from? Where does cork come from? Oh. It, it's a natural product. A tree. A tree, exactly. <laughs> okay? Uh, so it's basically a really soft wood. Okay? And so if we took this key off and you could see it, you would see that there's a slight indention in it and that's where the, the key is touching the tone hole, okay? And so that is gonna happen naturally. You're gonna get indentions in the pads as you, as you play them normally, but if you squeeze the oboe putting it together, that's gonna make that worse quicker, and your oboe is gonna go out of adjustment, and the pads themselves are gonna start leaking, okay? So when a pad is installed brand new in an oboe, the pad is nice and flat, and it comes down and touches the tone hole perfectly all the way around. And then as it gets that deeper indention in it, it's gonna start leaking because it's not in that original orientation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because our keys, if we could have an oboe with keys that went straight up and down like a piston, we would have, our adjustments would stay in an adjustment longer, I feel. Uh, but they're not, they, they pivot back here. So there's a lot of angles going on. And because of that, any time that pad gets a little deeper indention, it, it's going to leak somewhere. Uh, and that's the reason you should have professional maintenance done once a year, every couple of years. Because um, at some point, your pads are going to start leaking, and it's going to be bad enough where just doing basic adjustments, so turning these screws where that's not going to help anymore. Okay? So a lot of stuff going on. So that's just one reason I recommend. Uh, not squeezing uh, keys when the uh, when you're assembling the oboe. Any questions about that? Kind of makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe at the very end, do you have to leave like right at three-ish or whatever the time is? Three fifteen. Three fifteen. Yeah. Okay. They have a rehearsal downstairs. Gotcha. Okay. So we'll try to get through the rest of this, and then when I'm checking like adjustments, I'll have to take off several keys to get to your issue here, but I don't know if you see that, oh, that's, out. that screw back yeah. out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, tell him Jason Onk said. Yeah, okay. you need to stay. <laughs> okay. You want me to text him? I mean, when they're done with this, I'm going to I'm gonna text him and say, Lee is staying over here. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say, oh, oh okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, let's see. So uh, one other thing um, we've seen, like I was saying with the uh, the flute player, don't sit on your flute. Like that's a big thing with flute players, right? Because they'll they'll be in band or orchestra, they'll get like a ten minute break or something. They'll put it on their chair, and then of course when you sit on a flute, what's it do? It kind of smiles at you, right? <laughs> um, and so oboes don't smile, they don't bend, but they do break. So that center tenon that you when you put your oboe together, that definitely can break off. And so you don't ever want to uh, let, lay your oboe in a chair. Um, my recommendation is if the oboe is not currently being played in your hands, that it's in a case. Okay? So it's either one or the other. It's in your hands being played or in the case, especially if you're at a location like this in a school situation where there's other kids that do not care about your property. Okay? And you definitely don't put it on a music stand. Um, you know, you don't ask the band director to hold it for you. Like, like nobody should hold your oboe unless it's like a hired private teacher or yourself. Okay, maybe as you get older and you have oboe colleagues that you really know and trust, and you know they're responsible, and you guys want to play each other's oboe. You know, in college, you know that's different. Uh, but especially in high school. I wouldn't even let the oboe player next to you, if you have one, uh, play your oboe, okay? Especially, well, it doesn't matter if you own it or not, okay? Um, and that's one thing that's going to help you stay out of the shop, because we just had too many people. Um, I mean, I've had plenty of professionals loan their oboe to their students, and then they end up in the shop, mm -hmm. okay? And it's just, it's something about that inexperience, uh, it's something about it's not their property, uh, so people, you know, they don't care as much, maybe, okay? So, um, yeah, always in your hands. Now, if you're at home by yourself and you're practicing, like a day off from school, weekend or something like that, uh, and you're practicing, you want to take a 15-minute break, and you have a nice sturdy table where there's no animals, no cats, especially cats because they jump up on tables. Um, I guess dogs can too, depending on your dog. Um, yeah, sitting it on the table for a few minutes while you take a break, that's perfectly fine. Just make sure it's a sturdy table and there's no cats around. Which way do you sit it? That's on the list, oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, so when you do set your oboe down, please demonstrate, Kevin. <laughs> okay, perfect example of how not to set your oboe down. <laughs> okay. In my opinion, uh, you should set your oboe on the, so in playing position, on the right side, okay? Now there's all, there are levers, there are things that could get bent, so if you set it down really hard or like stepped on it, you're going to bend and break something, okay? But simply laying your oboe on this side, watch, watch this low B flat lever, okay? So just even setting it down easily. Okay, so we don't want to do that. So, and in your case, it may or may not have, have damaged or taken this out of adjustment. Yeah, yours is out of adjustment. It might have been that way already. Um, so we'll fix that too. Um, but let's say, you know, you just had it in the shop, you know, it's perfectly tuned up, it's you know, in adjustment, um, and it just takes one time. You just set it down and boom, and uh, you know, we all love playing low B flats, right? <laughs> <laughs> What's that face for? <laughs> so, right, because we love playing low B flats, but if your oboe's in adjustment, it's actually not that bad, okay? So, you know, if you have a decent read. Um, but yeah, being out of adjustment uh, will definitely make that more difficult, okay? And right now, yours is uh, virtually impossible. Just looking at the adjustments, it would be very difficult for you to play a low B flat. So we'll try to get that going for you. Okay. All right. 
Um, yeah, that was the next thing. We got that. You guys uh, swab, use a swab or a feather. Yeah. But mine's hard to go through the oboe, so I don't. I can get it and show you. Yeah, let's look at it. Whoa. Hi, Hi there. Hello. How this are you? Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Is that E R I N? Yeah. So we did introductions earlier. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from Memphis. Memphis? Okay. And how long have you been playing oboe? Uh, sixth grade. Sixth grade. Uh, six years. So are you going to be a senior? Yes. Okay. Excellent. And you must love it. And you must be pretty good because you're here, <laughs> right? I like to think so. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Okay, so you got your swab. So we talked about, um, well, I'm videoing this. So later, um, I'll at some point put this up somewhere and so we can share so you can hear some of the stuff that you missed. Okay. So we talked about the basics of how to assemble mm -hmm. and how to lay our oboes down when we do take a break. Mm -hmm. um, but now we're going to talk about um, the basics of swabbing, cleaning. Um, so you said yours is hard to, to yeah. pull through. As soon as it gets to the top joint, I have to like really tug on it, and I know that it's probably not a good thing. Well, this so looks like a regular uh, pull-through silk swab, so it's probably normal. Um, Ooh. Yeah, that's a little tighter than normal, maybe. Um, it's probably because of the stitching. So. Maybe yours, um, I mean, I think it is a, that is a pull through swab. It's not super big, um, but maybe let's pretend like yours is a non pull through swab. So they have regular silk swabs that are pull through and then they make swabs that are non pull through, which I didn't bring one, but I they're one over there. It's a Lorraine one. Yes. That are massive. They're big, right? They just have more material. So you literally cannot pull them through. And so when you use those, you basically, you pull it until it gets snug and then you just pull it back out, okay? So that would probably be a good thing for you to do. Um, we don't have time to get into um, blowing oboes out and the process of oboes changing, but I've always been a swab user, but I do think uh, now that I've been playing for 25 years um, and I did have an oboe that I had for 20 years and that oboe did, in fact, change uh, the bore. Um, and so it's kind of like, I think I finally decided, I, I do believe that if you have an oboe and you keep it for 20 years and you are a swab user, that that will so very slowly change the dimensions of the bore, okay? And if you look at a rock that gets water dripping on it for 100 years, you know, I don't know how long it takes, right? But all materials can wear, uh, just like a rock with a, a drip of water on it, okay? So things can wear, and so I do think uh, that using a swab, so, and with all that said, if you pretend your swab is a non-pull through, where you're not putting that much force on it, um, I think you're, you know, in that respect, your oboe would last longer, but you're also preventing your swab from getting stuck. Okay, which is but the reason we're the talking. The problem with that swab is it's so narrow, it's not going to do anything in the bottom joint. Uh, it does very little yeah. cleaning out the bottom joint. So you're kind of yeah, a, that's true. rock in a hard place. Yeah, all of, all of these pull-through swabs. Yeah, I agree. Right. I agree. Yeah. So yeah. do you recommend a feather? So I recommend, I don't, I don't say one way or the other. Because um, they both have drawbacks. They both have drawbacks, that's right. Well, so that's, it's touching the bore. I get, yeah, I guess. It, it's touching the bore, so, you know, it's going to do okay, and okay. majority of the, the moisture is going to be up here at the top, so um, it's, it should be okay. One thing that you can do, one thing that you can do, A, swabs need to be washed. Okay, so if you use a swab for a couple months, it's going to start 
getting nasty. So you can wash it out in your kitchen sink with soap and water, just Dawn detergent that, you're, that you have there. Um, and then if you're really anal like me, you can get the iron out and make it all pretty. I know I like to, that's right, right. And when you do that, when you freshen it up, it's gonna make it wide again, let's say. You know, and then it's gonna swab the lower joint yeah. of your elbow better. Hello. What's your name? Madison. Madison. I'm Jason. Nice to meet you. What grade are you going into? I'm gonna be a senior. Senior, okay. Where do you go to school? Oh, sweet. Okay. And when did you start playing oboe? Sixth grade. Sixth grade. So six years or so. Cool. So is that Hendersonville High School? Okay. My family, my mom grew up in Hendersonville. My aunt worked at Hendersonville High School as a secretary forever. I think she's been retired for a while, so you probably don't know her. But uh, my family's very familiar with, with Hendersonville. Um, yeah, all my cousins went to school there too. Um, so, um, forget where I was. So yeah, so occasionally if you use a, a swab, whether that's pull through or non pull through, should be washed and ironed, you know, just if you're like me. Um, now, so let's say you have a, a swab. So this one's a, a regular pull through that pulls through easier than this one. So let me uh, demonstrate how I recommend that you do that. Um, has anybody got their swab stuck in their robo? Do you swab or do you use a feather? Swab. swab. All right. So you guys are so lucky. You haven't got your swab stuck yet. It will happen, okay? And so if there's ever a time that you're pulling your swab through and you feel that it's not pulling like it did before, stop immediately. That's number one. But I'm gonna show you a technique and method which hopefully will allow you to be swab sticking free for your, the rest of your life, okay? Um, and so you probably heard you need to look at your swab, make sure there's no knots in it, okay? That's always first and foremost. Um, the swab is, is just small enough, big enough, whatever, to fit through the oboe. So any change in the diameter, the dimensions of this is going to make it hard to go through, right? And so it's going to get stuck. Now, a lot of you may have a swab with the string on the other side. And so that is designed to help you. So just to demonstrate, let's say we pull this through and let's pretend that it's stuck. Theoretically, if it gets stuck, you can undo your oboe like this if it's not already apart. And there's that string and you can pull the swab back My out. The one that came up okay. Years ago. All right. Excellent. Well, it's a, a very yeah. good solution. That's because my husband saw a lot of stuck swabs and we thought, hmm, oh, yeah. we put a string on the end. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. I did not know who did that first. So, awesome. It was a long time ago. A long time ago. 30 years ago. Okay. Sweet. <laughs> so, my first swab that I got stuck in my oboe did not have one of these. <laughs> okay. And the tendency is to want to pull harder. Right. Because that we're humans, you know, we think, oh, we can get it out, we'll just go pull harder. Yep. So that's scenario number one, like if you have the swab and you do get it stuck, theoretically you can get it out by taking the oboe apart and the string should be there, okay? And then you can pull it back out, theoretically. Uh, we've seen all kinds of craziness in our oboe repair shop. Um, more than once, maybe a half a dozen times, we got oboes in our shop. I don't know how it does it, but the oboe swab is completely stuck up in the, in the oboe with both strings coming out of the top. I, I can't explain it. I can't explain it, okay? But in that instance, uh, that little extra string is not going to help you, <laughs> okay? So, again, I can't explain it, so I don't know. But I will explain um, how to not get your, elbow, your swab stuck. 
So again, visualize, no, no, uh, no knots. And so I've always swabbed mine uh, with the yobo all the way together. Uh, some people take them apart. Um, you know, we'll leave that up to you. If you take it apart, there's probably even less likelihood that it'll get stuck just because you can see more of it. Uh, but if you do it this way, go ahead and feed the swab through after you've looked and made sure there's no knots. And then this is where everybody makes the mistake. They think they got it through like that and there's no knots. And then in band or orchestra, they start talking to their buddy as you're disassembling and putting your stuff up. And then they start pulling and kind of jerking and not looking and you pull it through very fast, okay? And so my theory is for all these stuck swabs is that just during that process of not paying attention and jerking it, it just knots up on itself somehow and then you pull it through and then boom, all of a sudden it's stuck, okay? Again, I still can't explain the string coming out of both ends, but, um, but that's what happens, okay? Because you can, everybody that brings in a stuck swab, they say, I looked, it didn't have any knots. And then sure enough, it still gets stuck, okay? And so when you're swabbing your oboe, do not talk to your friends, <laughs> okay? Pay attention. But the most important is once you get it started, I hold it, I hold mine up like this, and then just pull very slowly. Okay. We started doing okay. something different with our swans. Please tell me. Other way. Yes. Do you know why? So I've seen that. So we've made we've made the the side with the um, weight longer so it fits all the way down to the bell you know what I mean so the huh? string is longer oh okay so we can just pull it from the bell gotcha and our, our theory in that and you know I'm, I'm I see to, our theory in that is we're not wringing out the swab where we always get water you know if the swab is wet enough and you're pulling it through the top joint you're gonna actually be Bringing out some of the water into the top joint. I don't know. You know, some that could help. Too much time on our hands, I guess. But so we came up with yeah. the other way. So I've seen a lot of people do that. Um, it's probably. Uh, and then it goes with the the way the water goes, and keeps your right, technically right. going the same way. So I'm not opposed to that. Um, but kind of what you were saying a while ago, you were saying hers was too small to do anything down here. I do think if you do this method, that it might constrict that swab right away, and it does less down here, but it's not the end of the world. So. I don't know, because no. the other side is bigger. Right. You know, and as long as it fits through the top, I don't know. Yeah, you know, no, I agree. There's a billion different ways to do it. Yeah. It's just um, yeah, I'm not saying that's right or wrong or it doesn't yeah. work. It yeah. definitely works and it definitely prevents you from getting your swab stuck in your oboe. Right. So, yeah, if you guys want to go from the top, absolutely give it a go. But you still, you want to pull slowly. Yeah. And again, um, this one, the regular swab, is not long enough to grab it. Right. Well, it is right there, so you can... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you can reach it, so there it is, yeah. So then you would just do the very same thing. Again, pay attention to what you're doing, not talking to your friends. Just pull it very slowly. Well, uh, let's see, this one. So depending on the stitching, so it does get, this is the biggest part of the swab and there's, there is stitching around. Yeah, I think that's why hers doesn't go through the top. Or maybe it's yeah. why, I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, you do have. You might have to pull a little bit more because of that stitching. Um, yeah. So again, no knots. Put it in very slowly. Pull very slowly. Um, and if ever it feels like it's tighter than it's ever been before, then you stop immediately. Uh, if you've done the very slow method, and it does feel tight, and you have, especially if you have the extra string on the second side. You can then pull your oboe apart and it will be there, okay? Uh, and that way you can prevent uh, swabs getting stuck. This does not exclude clarinet players, okay? 
I've extracted several swabs, the exact same thing in clarinets. Okay, usually on a clarinet, what happens is you know clarinet swabs are much bigger, um, but they'll pull it through and they'll be jerking it, and it'll get stuck on that register tube on the inside, and then it gets knotted up and it won't go past that tube. And so the clarinet bore is much larger, and you don't see that as often in clarinets, but it does happen. Uh, because there's the well, there's the thumb tube and the register tube. There's two pieces of metal that ex um, extend into the bore of the clarinet. Okay, and so when you're doing a, a pull-through silk swab in a clarinet, you have to do the same thing. You know, put it through and then just pull very slowly. Okay. Of course, but you're welcome to come in anyway. <laughs> Is that Wall Decker? Is it Wall Decker out there? Uh, I don't. Okay. No, it's fine. And what is your name? I'm Amanda. Amanda. Yeah. And you play oboe. Yeah. How long have you been playing? Six years. Six years. So all you guys pretty much, except Kevin. Well, no, I'm still no. six years. Oh, you have your oboe with you? Oh, that's right, because you're going, you're going to be a junior. That's right. So you guys are all six-year players. Awesome. Where do you go to school? I go to Sweetwater. Sweetwater. And it's in between Knoxville and Chattanooga. Okay. Where so you you're, from? I am from Smyrna, Tennessee, just right down the road. Oh. I am local. All right. Okay, so now then we talked about feathers. So this is a, uh, a turkey feather. Uh, a lot of people prefer to use feathers simply the fact they don't even want to think about getting a swab stuck. Um, there may be other reasons. Um, I haven't had this long conversation with many people on feathers, but um, as we talked about earlier, I think all materials do wear over time. And so um, I'm really starting to think that if you do not, if you're going to keep an oboe for a long period of time, and you do not want any of that bore dimensions to change, especially in the, the very top of the upper joint, that it could be beneficial for you to use a swab instead, okay? Um, you mean a feather instead? I mean, a, yes, a feather. Whether you use a feather or a swab, a lot of times you will never get 100% of the moisture out of the yobo, but what you're wanting to do is to get a majority of it out, and if there is a track of, of moisture in there. Uh, if you get some of it out and you kind of disperse it a little bit, so you kind of wipe it, you know, hopefully it's going to dry out and it's going to, you know, go away much faster when you put it in the case, right? It's going to evaporate, okay? Instead of just leaving big, you know, clops of, of moisture in there, okay? Um, so feathers uh, could be very beneficial if, if you're going to keep an oboe for a very long time. Um, I guess what I see with professionals is they don't keep them for 10 to 20 years. Uh, people that are like their de jobs depend on you know playing in the orchestras or teaching at the colleges you know they're getting oboes you know new oboes or newer oboes fairly frequent which could be every five years for some people um, I've known some people to do every year, um, which is, you know, that's crazy. Um, but I just, you know, it's comfort, right? So whatever floats your boat. I don't try not to judge anybody if they can do that. Well, be careful now. Can somebody, can uh, Amanda grab that oboe maybe real yeah, quick? I'm just gonna use two hands. Yeah, there we go. Excellent. Awesome. Um, Yeah, so, you know, and if you, if you are able to, once you get, you know, if you're going to be a professional oboe player and you can buy an oboe and play it for a year and then sell it, you probably get a lot of your money back. So you, you could get a new oboe every year and it's not too big of a deal, but it um, can be a hassle. And then finding one that you really love as much as the one you previously bought can take a while. So, you know. Whether you, if you want to do one every year, it may not happen that way just because you can't find the oboe, right? Um, and maybe you want to switch brands because there's lots of brands out there and 
there's a lot of brands that are making great oboes nowadays. It's not like 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Okay, so um, this is a real turkey feather. Um, I buy them from my shop from a uh, Indian reservation in California. They sell them online, uh, fairly inexpensive. Um, if you go to like music stores or Amy, you may sell them through your store. Do you do real ones or the? I do real ones. Yeah. So some people sell real ones. Some people sell synthetic. Some people bleach them. Yeah. yeah. I don't believe in that. And they'll I think. they'll be white. Yeah. Um, so you yeah. might when you first if you get one, a real one that hasn't been cleaned up. So I've already cleaned kind of I took I just ripped off some of these excess little feathers down here. Um, you know I get rid of that and then I went ahead and just cut off the very middle of the tip because it's super fragile and it's going to break anyway. Uh, so I just cut that off. Um, and if you were going to use that, you would definitely have to take your oboe apart first. And you would just simply, uh, you know, when you first use it, you kind of got to shimmy and shake it. But you just kind of get in there and swirl it around. I don't know what proper, I've never actually done this. <laughs> I've never been a feather user, so yeah. I don't know That's if there's a I don't know if there's an amazing feather technique. I think uh, the most important <laughs> thing you have to remember is that tends if it's wet, it's going to gather dust. That's my theory, and so then you're putting That's dust, true. and then you're depositing stuff into your tone holes. Yep. So, and that be also happens with swabs, which is yeah. why I say you should a swabs get nasty, but you it also collects dust when it's sitting in your case or whatever it's going to collect dust, so you should wash your swab. Um, yeah, and feathers definitely would have a tendency to collect dust, and so, you know, there's no reason you couldn't spritz those off in the sink as well. But at some point, this is going to die, and so you'll have to uh, get another one. I do not know how long that takes to kill a feather, because I don't, I've they never... They get pretty gross looking. Yeah. You know, okay, it's <laughs> Usually get them in packs of three. I think we sell yeah. them for like five ninety five for okay. a set of three. You know. Wow, that's a great price. And it lasts for quite a while. Yeah, I get yeah. them from a turkey farm. Okay. I get them by the pound, which is like you know, this oh my gosh. thing arrives at my door. Wow. Oh, my turkey feathers are here. That's fantastic. <laughs> the UPS guy goes to pick it up and he goes, whoa, because <laughs> it's so light. Nice. <laughs> anyway. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> yeah, so... Feather in, and then you'd have to take this apart as well. And you swap the lower joint, and just kind of see if there's any water standing, and you might have to do it a couple times. Okay. Nice. We'll see what's up next. Um, Y'all have any questions, or you have any stories about swabbing that you want to share? No questions. Does anybody? Some of you came in. Does anybody have a non-pull through swab? So you use a swab and it pulls all the way through? Okay. So we, I think before you came in, we talked about the non-pull throughs. And so those are available if you want to not worry about getting a swab stuck. Uh, next time you buy one, that could be an option for you. Uh, and it's just basically a larger swab. You could probably buy a clarinet pull through swab. And, yeah. that, and that would be a non- Although I don't think the so, weight- Oh, that, that's true. Pop. The weight may be a different size. Yeah, so stick with the Yobo. Yeah. Bad idea. <laughs> All right. Um, temperature changes. Okay. So, um, has anybody had their oboe crack on them? Wow. That's impressive. No. Everybody have wood oboes for the most part? Yours isn't. Yep. Yeah, we've talked about warming them up. So, I think MTSU, I think they just overhauled this facility a little bit regarding to the heat and air system. Um, but in the previous years, like always the first week of governor school, we would get a cracked oboe or clarinet coming in. Yeah, three clarinets cracked. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And it's because this building used to be, you'd be in this room and it would be... It's still that way. Okay. You know, there's never going to be, you're never going to walk out of this room and have it, it's warmer in the hallway than it is in here. It's hot in the hall itself. Yeah. Right. So you have all different okay. know, temperature changes. So tell them how they should go from room to room if they well, insist on having their robots out. So I would say put them in their cases, 
always. That's my, always my default. Mm -hmm. uh, I know. I mean, mine's I saw, sitting over there. I know somebody just walked in and, and hit their oboe on the side of the door when they came in. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, lots of lots of stuff can happen. It's okay. I'm not blaming. I'm not saying anything. Okay, but just as an example, stuff happens, um, and I don't, I think when you did that, it actually hit the wood. So, other than maybe putting a little ding or a scratch. You know, you're not bending keys, so so you got lucky. It could have been worse. Um, so yeah, we talked about a while ago, if you're practicing and, and you get a break in band, you don't want to leave your oboe sitting around for your band mates or orchestra mates to knock it off. Um, and so that would be the same as, for, like in this type of situation, going from one room to another. If at all possible, put your instrument in its case and just travel very safely, okay? But then you get, let's say we're in this room, which feels very comfortable um, for the most part. Then you go to another room uh, for a different rehearsal um, and it's 10 degrees cooler, okay? So you, in that instance, you have to keep your oboe super warm all the time, okay? So you would want to you know, keep your hands on it or you can put the upper joint kind of under your arm while you're getting something ready, okay? Um, but you want to keep it warm. So if your oboe gets cold, um, so let's say it's overnight at your house um, and the air conditioning is on in the summer, um, your oboe is laying in the case wherever, and you get it out to practice the next morning and it feels super chilly. You know, it's not room temperature, it's cool. You never want to blow hot air into your oboe when it's cold. Have you guys heard this before? Yep, okay. So it's very important, especially on the oboe. Now it's important for clarinet too, um, but the, again, we talked about the bore of the clarinet is much larger, and so there's more room for forgiveness, okay? And so it takes a much more extreme example in a lot of cases um, for a, a clarinet to crack, but sometimes not. I mean, it, you never know. Every piece of wood is different. That's why there's no certainty around any of this. <laughs> Um, but the basic principle is uh, the wood gets super cold and then you blow hot air into it and so basically the inside of the oboe wants to expand but there's a lot of wood on the outside of that all the way out to the outside of the oboe that does not expand and is preventing it from expanding and that's where the stress comes and you'll get cracks and cracks usually occur in this part of the oboe and that's because it's the smallest part um, essentially at the top where the reed goes in is about four millimeters at the top of the bore and then from here to approximately here down to your half hole key it's about five millimeters here so between here and here there's a difference of one millimeter as far as the taper is concerned and so there's a lot of wood around that and the, the wood does not want to expand if you blow hot air into it, okay? And then, so that's what's gonna cause your cracks. Um, so yeah, if you go from one room to another and you, it's warm already, just make sure you're holding it uh, under your arm, whatever you need to do, okay? Uh, this is the, the age old quest uh, for all oboists is to keep their instruments warm so that they don't crack. Uh, say some of you guys become professional oboists and you play pit gigs, play musicals or operas, you know, that's always a really challenge because pits are typically more drafty and, and chilly uh, than being up on an orchestra stage with the lights directly on you and that type of situation. Um, but it can be extremely drafty if you're on a regular stage. Um, if it's a multi-purpose stage, like a theater slash concert stage, um, they can have super powerful uh, HVAC systems with draftiness going across you as you're playing. And so you just, however you need to keep it warm, uh, do so, okay? Um, during the summertime, you don't want to leave your instrument, well, you never want to leave your instrument in its car, but in the summer, if it's hot, um, the glue holds all these pads in, and so the glue could start to become malleable and pads could either fall out or pads could change just enough to make it not playable, okay? So you wanna stay away from extreme heat. 
Um, and then obviously the extreme cold in the winter time. If it does get extremely cold, so in our repair shop we ship 20, you know, 12, 12 months out of the year, right, year round. Um, and so instruments, we ship them when it's 30 degrees outside. So the key is on that one is the warming up. And so if your instrument gets super cold, uh, you want to just let it warm up to room temperature on its own. And then when it gets close to room temperature, that's when you can, can hold it and start warming it up to body temperature or whatever. And then you can blow on it, okay? Same thing with condensation. You guys get uh, water in your octave keys. Is that a thing for you guys? Yeah. So number one is having them clean, okay? Uh, but even when they're clean, people have lots of issues with water getting in octave keys. And so I think that has to do a lot with uh, temperature, okay? So if you look at your oboe and you kind of hold your second octave key open, you can see that there's a metal, a piece of metal there, a little metal tone hole. You guys see that? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, underneath the main, like where your right hand goes, down here, that's just wood. Okay. Uh, some of you, you got a Howarth. Uh, yeah. So those are just wood. Yep. So most of you have wood, except for yours. It's not a wood oboe, um, which is fine. So those are wood. But yeah, under here, uh, that's metal. And so the reason that is is because that's a two part tone hole. That metal piece that you see with your eyes unscrews and comes out and then installed down in the wood is another metal piece which is like a, a well. Um, you know you can look down in there and it's a little metal piece. And so even when those are clean and the instrument gets cool, so let's say you get it where you think it's up to room temperature or, or body temperature, but it possibly cannot be all the way through, okay? And so the, the metal insert in there for those octave keys, uh, the, the metal could still be a little bit cool, okay? The wood may feel like it's warm, but the metal could not. And so what happens when you blow on a cold glass or mirror? Condensates, right? Instantly. And I think that's what happens to those metal vents in there. So I've had many, many clients that can continue complaining about excess moisture in their octave vents, and I explain that to them and have them basically just take more time to warm their oboe up, and most of the time that corrects the situation outside of making sure that it's clean and sealed properly, okay? So uh, that's another reason you should keep your oboe warm, um, going from room to room, or just if, if you're playing it for the first time uh, during the day, okay? Any questions about that? Am I keeping you awake or you need a nap? <laughs> when do you guys start your mornings here? Eight? And you go all day? All right. Getting you ready for college in the real world. Sweet. And I didn't ask now that most of you, is this everybody? Okay. So how many of you are aspiring to possibly be a professional oboist? Two and a half, three-ish. What are your interests? Music education. Okay. So you you would do oboe through college as your primary, but be a band director or something. Okay. Excellent. How about you? So like symphony type thing, or you like teach at a college? Okay. Maybe music. I don't know. I kind of want to open my own business. I just don't know what. Yeah. So music's kind of like. Thing. Nice. I guess it's always been like always so. tie it in. Yeah. Like I do. Oh yeah. So. I'm happy to talk to you about my experience later down the road if you want to give me a call. And I'm sure uh, Amy would would be happy to talk to you about her business experiences as well. Cool. Um, and you said simply. Simply. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. So you guys are going to be dealing with some of these things we're talking about for a very long time to come. Um, and so you just, a lot of times it's patience uh, making reads <laughs> and just day to day in and out practicing uh, just in general with the oboe is patience. Um, and so the same with maintenance, uh, warming the oboes up and you know, just really taking, taking time and your due diligence to, 
to do great stuff every day and, and not be in a rush. Um, so, oh yeah, so uh, here, let's do the tenons now. Um, so what kind, do y'all use some type of uh, lubricant on your, uh, your tenon corks? No cork grease? Ambassador uh, chamber group with Leah. Was she here? You are. You are Leah. Oh, She's right here. oh I there. didn't know you were here. Oh, sorry. Okay. We didn't know you were going to miss master class. I forgot to text Todd. Oh, forgot. That's my fault. Oh, sorry. Okay. Good deal. Wow. She she didn't leave the the, the building. Oh. No. <laughs> uh oh. Yeah, sorry. Everybody uses lubricant. I've seen you guys. Yes. Use the tube stuff. Yes, yeah, so you have like a, a cork grease or something? Oh, yeah. oh. Yeah. So what do you have? I have cork grease like in a tube. tube. Okay, a tube. Yeah. So a lot of tubes, um, it's hard to know what's in a lot of those tubes. I use Carlos's. Do you, you know Carlos? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I use his blend. Yeah, I'm not sure what he Good sells. <laughs> I wish I could unlock the door permanently. We've been missing her. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Oh, hi. Jason. You're interrupting. <laughs> oh, are we online? Is this a live stream? Yes. No, it's not live. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh well, well, we wanted to get a picture. Oh, so, but not right. now. At the end. Okay. The end. okay. If you want to do it. <laughs> sorry. No one asked. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, I'm sure whatever Carlos has put together and sells is like a synthetic or a natural thing. So, uh, the, the basics of it, uh, if you need a cork grease, you want to use something that's a uh, synthetic or uh, natural product, okay? So, most of the cork greases, say, in the 20, 30 years past were just a general, like, petroleum base, right? So, the same thing that your motor oil and, you know, those types of products are made out of petroleum. And so the, what, the reason that is like super bad, uh, when you put that on your tenon, so again, this is cork, and we discovered that cork is, comes from a living tree, uh, so it's just a very soft wood, right? And just like any tree, cork has pores going through the cork, the material, right? So in this one, uh, when it's on a, a tenon like this, a lot of times you can see those pores, and so you can see those, those holes or those dark places. You know, those are just like really big pores, and then there's really small ones. Uh, and so over time, if you use cork grease, um, especially the petroleum-based stuff, that will very slowly seep through the pores of the cork, and it will eat away at the glue that holds the cork on, and then the cork could just fall off one day prematurely. Your corks will fall off regardless over time or need to be replaced because they wear out, but we do not want to... Um, speed that process up by using a product that's going to do that. Um, so what I used to buy, um, and I don't buy it now because they quit making it uh, from, I believe, animal rights activism, um, neither here nor there, but anyway, this is not available. But this is uh, Kiwi's brand, it's a, called Mink Oil, it's a boot polish, or what people use as a boot polish. And I've been using this for like 15 years. And so it lasts a very long time. But this is just mink oil, which was from an animal, a mink. Uh, but it also has, um, what's it say? Silicone and lanolin. So it's all uh, natural or synthetic uh, concoction. So I learned this from John Simer. That's what he used. And so I went and bought some right away. Um, but again, this is hard to find. I think there is another brand that makes this, but the consistency is not the same, and it's, it's actually more um, icky and sticky. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, at this point, don't recommend it. Um, but if you just go online, um, wherever you buy stuff, uh, just ask them if it doesn't state it. Ask them what the consist consistency, the ingredients are, and you know if it's natural or a synthetic, uh, full synthetic product. Um, that'll be fine. I think the days of petroleum are going away. Um, it's easier to find uh, the good stuff, but definitely something to keep in mind. Um, 
All right, so after you have the, the correct product, and let's say you need to use it. So this is a perfect example. Um, Kevin's oboe, in my opinion, is slightly hard to put together, okay? And so when it gets to that point and your oboe is kind of hard to put together, um, besides just slathering more cork grease on there, I recommend that we clean it a little bit first. And so I just brought a plain, this is a like a shop automotive shop towel from Walmart, but you can use a napkin or a paper, regular household paper towel and just simply dry. You don't even have to put anything on it. Um, just kind of wipe it. And you can see just very quickly with hardly any pressure, I'm wiping that stuff off. And so you can kind of go around just like that. Be careful, but just get in there and wipe it. Lots of good stuff coming off, okay? Don't drop it. And you can kind of bunch it up a little bit so it gets back here in that corner. Okay. This is a good one. <laughs> you knew I was coming, so you saved up, right? Yeah. Sweet. All right, so right away, just by cleaning it, and if we try it, it's, well, hold on a second. So you also want to clean the receiver or the socket, okay? And so it's maybe a little harder to do. Um, I forgot to bring Q-tips, but if you have Q-tips, those are perfect yeah, we did that to the get in there. Day, okay. Saw, I mean, they were, yeah. Yeah. There was some yummy goodness. Pretty, pretty gnarly, right? So you can use Q-tips, but in this case, I'm just going to get as much as I can by using my pinky and this towel. Okay. Yep, got some good stuff out of there. What's that? There's still more in there. Yeah. Yeah, it gets especially, especially it gets pushed down in those little corners, but, and so that's where the Q-tips will work really great. Okay. Yeah, I probably wouldn't, yeah. <laughs> and so this is totally something you guys can do on your own. Um, all right, so then let's try it. It may be good with just, with just that. Oh, okay, I see what's going on. The wood's catching. Yeah, the wood's expanded a bit. Has that been doing that for a while? Do you know? It's been hard to put together for a while. Um, I guess so. I never really realized it was that yeah. hard to put together because I've only put together my own oboe. So I don't really have anything else to compare yeah. to. This is not your own? No, this or is my school's oboe. Oh, so you have another oboe? No. Oh, you don't? This is just the school's oboe that gotcha. I Gotcha, gotcha. I don't know that okay, so. And you guys can kind of see this so sometimes, and this is very true on brand new instruments, um, after, you, after you play them for a while and there's lots of moisture going through, uh, these tenons, uh, what I call a, a tenon rail, so it's the little piece of wood right above the cork, okay? That's very common to expand and more than likely because moisture gets caught in this thing, it's just, it's just a moisture magnet, right? And so those expand and so as we see, I can put this together, it feels pretty good, but then right when that wood starts to go all the way in there, it, it, it's more difficult, okay? So that's a very common thing. We see that on new instruments especially, but it can happen on older instruments, um, especially if you increase your playing all of a sudden. Um, and that, again, with government school students, I've seen that a lot. Um, I can't fix that here. I didn't bring my stuff. Oh, I might be able to. Um, but you can see, if you look at that piece of wood, how shiny it looks. Mm -hmm. And so that's just from the metal socket rubbing on the wood. So if you can see kind of how that wood is shiny down there. And so that's a good indicator. Uh, if your oboe seems like it's hard to go together, you can look at the, the wood on the tenon, and that would be the same for the, uh, for the bell tenon down here too. Um, if it starts getting hard to put together and then that wood is looks like it's kind of rubbing and getting shiny, um, that could be a thing. And you want to take that to a professional, okay? Um, so apply cork grease. Some of you have the little tubes like chapstick or something, okay? And some of you may have a, tub, a tub like this. Um, if you have the little chapstick thing, you can start off by just kind of wiping it on there. But then once you just kind of wipe it once, then you should be able to finish by squeezing it around with your finger. 
okay? Uh, for these, you can, that might be too much, a little bit on your finger, put that on there, and then wipe around. Now, before you shove it together, if you can see it on there, it's too much, okay? So I'm actually kind of rubbing in a little bit, and it, you know, I don't really see it, right? But if you were to put it on there and there was like a little glob of it, that glob's not gonna do anything except for get pushed all the way back and then it's gonna squeeze out onto your instrument, okay? So cork grease just takes a tiny, tiny little bit, okay? And voila. Let's see this one. I did this one backwards. Take your oboe apart and put it back together now. Mucho better. Now she's afraid to <laughs> take it apart. <laughs> so you would, uh, let's see, you, you're right handed? Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, yeah, so right hand, and you can kind of come over the keys down here and squeeze the wood. That is how we did that, right? It'll be weird because you've never done it that way, but squeeze the wood really hard. You're not going to hurt it. And then just, and then I didn't actually talk about real quick uh, when you're assembling and especially disassembling is to not turn your oboe too much, right? So to get it started, turn just a little bit like that and then turn back the other direction. And every time you turn, you're pulling a little bit, okay? And then it shouldn't take much to just come straight apart. But there's a lot of going, a lot going on there, and you don't want these things to bang together or the bridge keys. Cool. But that goes together a lot better, right? Mm -hmm. So just a very basic cleaner tenon, uh, some new core grease. Okay. I actually had one. I had an oboe in uh, for a warranty service this morning. Um, really, not much wrong with it, but the player, whoever it is. Um, put a lot of cork grease and it had oozed out and up and into the G-sharp pad, oh, nice. you know, and so stuff like, especially on the oboe, if you put too much, it's going to ooze up and it's going to get on your G-sharp pad and we don't need that pad sticking, right? So definitely uh, just minimal amount of cork grease. Um, general, general maintenance, we kind of talked about it the whole way, but there's a lot going on. Uh, so, you know, we recommend uh, all players to do annual maintenance. Um, in our shop, an annual maintenance, actually, we take the oboe completely apart. We wash the body, it gets sanitized. Every tone hole gets cleaned, not just the octave vents, okay? Um, we talked about dust getting in feathers and swabs. So what happens and what you can't see, and it, well, I could probably just take apart any of your oboe and show you, um, but as you swab over and over and over, because we do it multiple times a day, multiple times a week, um, little tiny microscopic particles of dust and dirt get in our swabs and our feathers. And it, although when you pull it through, it's soaking up some of that moisture and it's doing what it's supposed to, it's also depositing those tiny little bits of, of dust and dirt up under into the tone holes into like on professional oboes it's like into the undercutting area of the tone hole and so you if you look through your oboe you can't see it because it goes up in the tone hole okay and then over time that builds up and I've had plenty of oboes especially in the very top in these really small tone holes I've taken the oboe apart to clean it and like this half hole tone hole or the C somebody will send that in and say my C is like really really flat they're like, can you tune that? And I take the key off and the tone hole is like completely clogged. Okay, so over time it builds up and more dust adds to more dust because there's moisture in the tone hole that you can't see, okay? So even though we're swabbing to get rid of moisture, there's always excess moisture that hangs around until it evaporates. Um, so in, in our shop, that's what we do. Take it completely apart, clean all the, the tone holes. Um, 
check tenon corks if they need to be replaced we replace them all the little adjustment corks and bumper corks you know we replace those if needed and then obviously as we reassemble we're checking every single pad leveling surfacing uh, making everything like it's brand new again um, some people even like us to polish the keys so it looks new so you know we, we do that occasionally um, it's not cheap but it's also in the grand scheme of things it may keeps you happy okay because it keeps your instrument value up exactly exactly um, you know if you buy a new one of these instruments depending on the model and where you get it it could be eight thousand nine thousand ten eleven twelve thousand dollars okay hey so um, yeah so oboes can be super expensive you know there may be some that you can get for six but I mean usually you're looking at least seven or more I don't do sales so I'm not totally up on prices but um, you know and then if you get a a smaller boutique what I call boutique oboe like a Lauben or something you know those are starting now to if, if you get one new which you want like 14 even they're they're crazy so your oboe is as much as a car I'm not a big car guy I hate spending money on cars and so my oboe would definitely be more than my car is worth okay and even cars that are cheap cars have to be maintained change the oil and stuff and so it's just the same um, you know you oboe can be very difficult to play okay uh, but if we keep our mechanism in tip-top shape and, and pads maintained and corks maintained um, and assuming you have a good source for reeds um, any of you guys make your own right now working on it yep so even though you are working on it maybe you are pretty handy at it you can get an oboe uh, get a reed to, to play um, it's still going to take many years of, of diligent work to well you may never be happy who knows <laughs> right that's the quest right uh, you're always you get one and maybe your best read to date but then you want to top it right so it's, there's nothing ever good enough um, and so but with the perfect read and an oboe that's highly maintained your music is going to be so much more simple to play and you're going to love it that much more um, I've known many people that that quit probably because of their instrument usually younger kids um, but I've known many professionals that have struggled way too long um, and then it's just been it's been a pleasure to do the service for them and then they're like oh my gosh you know I can't believe I didn't do this sooner um, and so we have a lot of professional converts um, and it's not that they don't know it's just you know maybe they weren't taught maybe or their their primary teacher in college didn't talk about it too much um, so it's something to think about, and uh, we're super happy to, to do work for you guys um, at any point. Uh, emergency stuff, if you're not local and you have a question, uh, we're very easy to get a hold of. Um, my wife uh, works with me nowadays, uh, about almost two years now. So she's on the phones and email, and um, you, know, you can always get a hold of us, especially social media. You guys do Instagram, Snapchat. Who does Snapchat? Okay. All right. So I'm on Snapchat too, but it's kind of new, so I'm still learning. So you guys uh, can follow me on Snapchat, uh, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we try to do a live video on Facebook once a week and Instagram too. So um, you can always DM me on Instagram for sure. I'm always on that. It's, it's fun. Um, so then one last thing I want to touch on, then you guys can totally ask questions or we can kind of look at your oboes. Um, your mouth. The cleanliness of your oboe starts here. Okay? How many of you drink sodas? Maybe, sometimes. Oh, yikes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay I used to drink it like all the time so all right 
So especially if you drink something with sugar in it, so that would be a soda, sweet tea, it doesn't matter. Any form of sugar, you need to at least wash your mouth out with water before you play your oboe, okay? How many of you carry toothbrushes, portable toothbrush and toothpaste with you? So that's better than doing nothing. <laughs> um, you don't drink it, do you? Not usually, no. Okay. Usually. <laughs> well, I mean, there's been some instances I haven't had time to go spit it out. I don't want to just throw it on the floor. <laughs> wow. Okay. I think there's some help. <laughs> <laughs> Concerned with that. <laughs> All right. So uh, at, at minimum, before you play, uh, you should wash your mouth out with water. Uh, if, if you don't carry a toothbrush and toothpaste with you, you should get some. go to Walmart after you get home and your parents can take you somewhere, get the travel stuff and carry it with you. And if you especially do sodas or you're somewhere and you drink, uh, drink that, um, anything you, you drink besides water, so that could be Gatorade, it doesn't matter, uh, or you eat lunch or dinner or whatever, um, it is the best option is to brush your teeth, okay? because all of that microscopic stuff will be left in your mouth even though you feel that you are not, you know, you've, it's been 15 minutes or whatever, there's still stuff there and that will go into your horn. If it's the sugary stuff, over time it will build up in your horn and will stick to pads and pads will become sticky. Uh, you'll notice it on your octave fence, your first octave key. So your, your first octave key works by pressing the button on the back, right? but that key pops up because there's a spring under there, okay? And that's always the first one that sticks, okay? And that'll, it's gonna stick without your help. So we, we need that, we don't need any extra help. And so brushing your teeth, washing your mouth out um, as much as possible uh, will help, okay? And I know in your schools, uh, schools have been it's super crazy, I understand. Uh, you, you probably have like seconds of, uh, you don't have time to use the bathroom, I get it. My daughter just graduated high school, she's going to college next year. I've got a freshman, she'll be a freshman. So we're right in the middle of that, I totally understand. Um, so, but if possible, you, know, you can squeeze out an extra 30 seconds to run in the bathroom and you know, you don't get the, the appropriate brush brushing, but you get enough to, you know, clean your teeth a little bit in your mouth, okay? Cool, y'all have any questions? Anything I didn't talk about that you wondered about or? They, there's several of them that have half hole issues. Okay. They have half hole issues, so I want you to, first of all, look at their half hole. Sure, sure. Um, so like when you say that, what type of, what type of like issue you like? will not come out. Okay. Um, like water in general, I think it might be because of the weather, but I've had water in this AK for like, Days. Okay. Oh, my AKs are really bad. Like we right spent like the entirety, concert. the first like ten minutes of our concert, which is trying to get yeah. water out of it. Yeah. It was, it was just scary. a river. Yeah. It was so bad. Well, it was so nasty. I had to stop playing. I used three pieces. So sometimes that's going to happen, and that's going to be your environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that we were talking about going from from hot to cold or cold to hot. Um, sometimes once it gets started, it's not going to stop until the instrument's completely dry. Uh, and so you have to do the best that you can. As a professional musician, you're going to have to do the best that you can because <laughs> the conductor does not care and the concert starts at 7 or 8. That's not going to stop because you're having water issues, okay? So, but some of them, the general maintenance that we talked about, making sure those are clean. Um, and since I don't know your instruments, there could be excess uh, dirt buildup in there. Um, uh, the other thing we talked about, and none of you guys are doing it, so that's a good thing, but you never, like you have your oboe in your lap, you never want to turn it over, right? You know, even if it turns over by accident for a second, I mean, you need to flip it back. Because if you've been playing and there's a, a moisture trail going down to your instrument, and then it flips over, where's that moisture going to go? Right? It's all common sense stuff, so I mean, you guys are doing great. Put it on your leg, and yeah. you don't know you're leaning slightly forward. It's so the same idea. Lean backwards if you're going to do that. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So uh, yeah, anything you can do to keep uh, keep that moisture from getting into the tone hole, right? Um, 
half hole issue so the high D thing could be an adjustment somewhere else but it could be um, could be could be the diamond it could be dirty uh, and so underneath sometimes it's dirty um, it could be dirty the diamond could be clogged um, yeah so we can look at that so I have a little bit more to do on your oboe so I want to see if I can hit these guys real quick Yeah, that'd be great.